With the recent tragic death of Sali, I know a lot of people are in sorrow, and some are even being nudged into extremely negative thoughts. These kind of events can tip over people in certain places in their lives to take extreme measures, such as ending their own life. If that person is you, then this video is for you. If you know anyone around you that is feeling in such a way, then this video is also for you as well. I have invited my friend and viewer of DKDK TV. Her name is Sharon Blady, and she is a former health minister of the province of Manitoba in Canada, and also a mental health educator, advocate, and consultant. I have invited Sharon to talk about how to get over feelings of suicide, as well as the right way to help people who are in such places. My name is Sharon Blady. I'm the former Minister of Health for the province of Manitoba. I'm a suicide survivor and I'm now a mental health advocate. How do people with suicidal tendencies deal with such tendencies? Well, as somebody that's been in that situation at least twice in my life, I guess the thing is, is that the place that we're in we don't see any hope and we only see pain. In some cases, it's a numbness. In some cases, it's actually feeling too much. And so for those of us that have survived it, I guess the, the one thing that we try to get across to other folks is that it's not a normal headspace. It's not a thing that you can easily explain to other folks and that we need to be understood a little bit differently and it's not something that you snap out of. The best way that I can, like I said, that I describe it is that when my own mental health issues are emerging, it's a case of my brain is wired a particular way and I have got tendencies towards anxiety, I have got bipolar 2. There's the inner critic that lives in my brain that hijacks that remote control. So if I'm in a bad mental health place and somebody says, oh, Sharon's talking this way, she's doing that, I kind of want them to actually understand that, no, 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 it's that condition has got my remote control, the inner critic has got my remote control, and it's flicking through my channels at a different volume, at a different intensity, in a different order than I would, but it's not me, it's somebody else. And that's one of the first things that I've kind of, becomes my sort of default setting now, yeah. is when I start to hear certain things, my brain is telling me different, oh, there's the inner critic. Right. Okay, hold on, buddy. No, you don't get to have my remote mm. control. What am I going to do to re to reclaim that remote control? First of all, it's the recognition. I am feeling anxious or I am feeling depressed. Oh, it's the depression that's trying to grab the remote control. Guess what? You don't get to have it. I'm going to work and do whatever I can. So I'm going to reframe things, but I'm also going to distract myself. Mm. Uh, one of the things that happened with me was uh, there was one time when I was suicidal where it was honestly it was a it was a girlfriend and her husband mm. <laughs> wanting to show up to mm. garden right. and I suddenly went oh my god they can't come to the house with me looking mm. like this mm -hmm. and so I got myself up and then she basically when they did finally show up they kept me busy in that garden for three days and I was busy doing whatever for three days that by the time it was all done I wasn't rainbows and sunshine but I was up over that threshold right. where I could actually got over the hump and and that remote control while I might not have had it firmly in my hand the inner critic no longer had it in their grip and you know 500 yards away where I couldn't get to it <laughs> it's the recognition it's the distraction and then it's and it is finding safe spaces so sometimes it is like in that particular case my friends got me out into the garden. Sometimes it's taking a friend out for a walk, taking them out of their house because a lot of times we self-isolate and that isolation is again part of that disconnect and while we feel safe here, we do literally become trapped. I've only got so much energy and if I can only get myself upright and maybe showered and maybe fed the notion of getting out the door you might as well be asking me to climb mount everest you know backpack you know blindfolded backwards and with a 50 pound backpack on my back what are some ways to perhaps identify people around us that have these tendencies and what are some ways to effectively help them out remember that we're not broken we're not broken 
we've got something else that goes on in our head and like I said it's that thing that's taking the remote control away so that when you're hearing someone talk a particular way or their behavior and it can be things like isolating it can be things like making plans it can be different kinds of things where you just notice something isn't right honestly it's just checking in mm -hmm. and asking somebody hey you know I've realize we haven't talked in a while just curious how you're doing what's mm. up it doesn't have to be initially anything that's very overt but if you start to sense okay you know what my spidey senses were tingling correctly what do you how, how are you doing you know what it's been a while since we've gone out for a walk would you like to go out for a walk find or talk about something engage them and just check in so just say you know hi how are you doing like don't yeah. even mention the yeah. thing that's don't the, even mention it at yeah, first yeah. Uh, until you're sure, but there's nothing wrong with expressing the concern. Okay, you know, I saw that maybe, you know, the post that you were making online just seemed a little, is everything okay? It just seemed a little quirky, a little off, or gee, your, your voice sounds a little, you know, are you tired or something? Is everything okay? Is there, is there anything I can help with? Offering some kind of connection. Mm. Um, and, and if somebody does indicate that they are feeling that badly about themselves and that hopeless, mm. then the, then you can say, well, is there anything I can do to help you? Is there somebody you'd like to talk to? Is mm -hmm. there somebody that I would, mm -hmm. you know, is there resources I can get you to? Because the other thing too, is a lot of times people don't feel they've got the energy, the ability offering somebody that support, because sometimes it is about, you know what, actually I do have a therapist and I probably could make a call to them. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to check you in? Do you want me to bring you there? Is there someone else that I can get you to that you trust? Is there some place we can do? And they may or may not have somebody already, but it's honestly about being there for someone. And some people might even try to push you off because we don't feel we're worthy of the connection at that time. It's just checking in, it's just staying in touch. Okay, well, you know what? How about I give you a call back in half an hour? Or you know what? If you change your mind, let me know. And it is about checking in on people. Right. The other thing that I have to say, and this might seem a little, um, drastic in the case of my uncle mm. my aunt was a nurse mm -hmm. and she literally left his side for five minutes to pop in the shower and came out and he was gone sometimes we are so committed to the idea that if we have a plan we're gonna follow through people will say committed suicide we die by suicide. We die by suicide the same way other people die of a heart attack. We don't take on the act. We're in a place where basically our disease, our condition compels us to participate in a way that cancer or a heart attack wouldn't. You do what you can, support us as much as you can, intervene, and this, but to prevent the contagion is recognize if you've done everything that you've, you think you could have or that you possibly imagine that you could have, go with that and 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 don't beat yourself up after the fact because we all sit there and go woulda shoulda coulda and um all that that's part of how the contagion spread gee if i had only called this person gee if i had been in better touch and then you watch somebody go down a secondary their own depressive hole and the next thing you know you've got a second person who's experiencing depression or suicidality be supportive reach out but you can't carry the weight of everything on your shoulders as well when somebody does hit that place. Do you have any good resources for people who are feeling suicidal or who have friends and family who are feeling suicidal um, that they can refer to? Um, I know like professional medical help is, you know, always the best option, but for a lot of people um, who have lived in countries where mental illness is viewed with a certain stigma, um, going to these medical professionals are not always a, an easy option for them. It's, it seems very daunting. I know for me, when I first went to therapy, it was very, very daunting for me. In terms of things like therapy, I guess actually this is going to sound like a, a, a strange thing, but I honestly think, especially if somebody has got through their, uh, whether it's through a public health system, if you've got access to something like that, I'd actually say check into it 
before you have a crisis, mm. before you're in need, because if you find out more about what's going on and talking to people, it makes it a little bit easier to talk. The other thing people can do too is, again, if you're feeling a little anxious about seeing a professional, I mean, it, there are different formats. There might be community groups that host peer related and peer facilitated things. And so that way you're talking to other people like you um, and you're talking to people that have got some kind of training in this, but it's not the same as you don't feel like you're being diagnosed or analyzed or whatever. And you're talking to other people that have probably occupied similar, mm. similar crappy mental health real mm. estate. It's like, oh, you live down the block from me. You're at the corner of anxiety <laughs> uh -huh. and depression. I'm at the corner uh -huh. of a anxiety like a and party. bipolar right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think the one thing to recognize is that in the same way that you would go to a doctor for tonsillitis, there is nothing wrong with checking in with your mental health for the same reason. It is no different. There shouldn't be any stigma around it. That doesn't mean that we don't have issues in our society about it. But honestly, you would not walk around on a broken leg or you would not stop, you know, oh geez, I'm too ashamed to go to the pharmacy and get my insulin. It's the same thing when you're dealing with your mental health. There should be no shame in it. It takes a lot, but find those other people that are supportive too. A lot of us come from families where, I mean, my family, you know, I love them, but at the same time, oh boy, raging ball of like mental health issues and denial. And that's the other part is, is also recognizing that there's certain people that you can't talk to about your mental health. Build that other family or that other set of connections of people that you can talk to. The one thing that I find liberating about talking to therapists or other folks that are in the mental health profession, they don't have an agenda other than to support you and to help you. Whereas talking to your brother, your aunt, your cousin, they've got an investment there. So honestly, there's a certain liberation right. to barfing something out person. to a stranger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is, this is a random person who's trained to deal with this. And they really don't have any investment in whatever right. the childhood dynamic right. was with you and your right. brother and your cousin. Right. And they're not gonna say, but you know, da 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 da, and, and suddenly, you know, take your uncle's side yeah. or whatever yeah. the issue is. You're just gonna barf that all out and their job is to literally help you sort through that and to ask you questions that in some cases, a lot of the work that they do is to ask you questions so that you help find the things that work for you. www.sharonblady.ca uh, and that's where I work with organizations and do corporate things to help people, whether it's reevaluate their protocols and their mental health policies, to work with governments and other organizations that maybe want to look at policy development. Geeky fangirl side of me has uh, www.speak-up.co. Uh, so my Speak Up site is my advocacy and that's advocacy grounded in mm -hmm. fandom. So I use the metaphors of superheroes uh, to explain what other people call a mental illness, I call a superpower. It's reframing, it's discussing those perspectives. And then I also do some stuff and I'll be starting to put it onto the, the YouTube channel soon where I'm gonna be doing meditations based on not just the superheroes, but also my fandom of BTS. Okay. So uh, meditations for those that uh, either don't like meditating, not really sure what meditating right. is, don't see themselves as a meditator, but have got a, a fandom aspect that you can tie right. into. So there's nothing like doing a Doctor Strange mm. uh, meditation mm. or an epiphany oh, or, uh, nice. you know, meditation. Nice. <laughs>